to try and try and entertaining for you. So this is the talk. Hi everyone. Um, I guess we'll start. Should we start? Yeah. Okay, I'm gonna do this. Normally my talks are pretty energetic, but I'm super tired, so I'm gonna sit down. I type and stuff like that. So don't worry if you can't see me. I'm still here. Uh, we're going to talk about MGMT. Uh, who am I? I'm a hacker. I work on config management. I read a technical blog called The Technical Blog of James. Who's seen it? Just raise your hand. Um, if you haven't seen it, just raise your hand so I seem really popular. Not bad. Maybe some of you. I guess I've been before. This talk's going to assume a lot of knowledge about automation, config management, and even a little bit about MGMT because if I've given intro talks before and I think you've had a chance to find out by now. So I'm going to show new stuff because I think that's more interesting. Right? Yeah? Yeah. All right. Uh, usual stuff. So just some background. Um, everything used to be horrible. I did Puppet for many years and it was interesting. I learned a lot, but it was also a bit of a disaster. And nowadays, every day we're kind of yammering um, with Kubernetes and Ansible and there's all sorts of crazy projects. There's this like YAML assembler. There's this Q project, which I think is super interesting. Uh, it's kind of like a compiler that tests uh, YAML and it's crazy. Um, but the whole fundamental idea, the whole goal behind infrastructure automation is to somehow model what our infrastructure should look like, and in my case, I believe over time. And I just don't believe that like we can do that by just describing things with YAML. I just don't think it's the right expressive language. Um, do you think that we can build infrastructure this way? What do you think? Do we want to be YAML programmers? Yes. All right, Rubik, you have to leave. Um, so this is my answer about if we can be YAML programmers and if we can build stuff this way. It's useful for certain things, but it's just being so misused and overused and over-engineered, especially with Kubernetes. So I'm just noping on this whole thing. So uh, some time ago, I sat down and I started writing what I wanted in a tool, uh, unfortunately. It's called MGMT. Um, and I guess you've seen it before. It has two parts again, an engine and the language. The language is this special reactive thing that we're going to demo again. Uh, it's got some important properties of the engine, which I've talked about before. Guess how many resources we have now in MGMT? These are the fundamental building blocks that do work on the system. Guess. Scream at a number. Don't be shy. 12. 15. No, more. More than 15, more than 12. We had 22 last year. Uh, this year we have 27. So um, I think we're pretty much got most of the normal things. The biggest thing we're missing is cloud resources. So we have like an EC2 resource, but we don't have like a Google, whatever the thing's called, and heaven forbid us or whatever. So that's what we're at. Um, try and do stuff useful now. Maybe there's a few parameters you're missing, but if you are missing something, let us know what it is so we can add it, or preferably you can add it. Um, and this is the sort of premise for our language. <coughs> Excuse me. We want to make a language, a DSL, it's very powerful, lets you do what you want without letting you do something that's super dangerous. So tools like, um, what's this tool that was here? Not Helm, the other one uh, that we had to talk of earlier. Oh my god, I'm forgetting the name. Um, where you write code and it does stuff like Terraform. Plumi. Plumi, yeah, like Plumi, it's interesting. It looks like it could be very powerful, but the fundamental premise of writing raw code, whether it's in Python or any of these languages, is just wrong. Because if you have a full language, you will do bad things, you will make mistakes, you can't model higher level properties that are easier to reason about. So this tool for me is completely the wrong idea for infrastructure. You need something constrained to prevent you from doing those bad things. And that's why we have our own language. Um, having said that, you might be able to use Plumi to build lots of interesting things, but um, as our infrastructure grows in complexity and scale, um, if you make an off by one error and you destroy a data center, that's on you. So don't say I didn't warn you. Um, here's some of the properties for our language, and I'll show you a demo um, that I've given before. You want to see a demo? Yeah. I've, I've done, done this demo before, but it's the, the best demo to sort of show everyone what's going on. So I'll just show you the code. Um, oops. Um, and all this code is on GitHub. So this is basically the code. There's no, I think if you like, what is it syntax, Perl, or what is it set? What is it? Syntax equals Perl. There we go. It's sort of, it's not Perl, but you know, ASTs are similar. So um, you can see we import some packages. This date time package um, has a function called now. Now is just a stream of seconds. It's the date in, in seconds since 1970. And we add it to this number here. And then this goes in a big struct. Um, all this stuff 
uh, down here, which ultimately goes into this file resource. And if we look at, if we run that code, um, and then over here, we can see it's created a file called date time. And if I make this run, you can see that every, turns out every second, the date time changes, because that's just how that function, how often it changes. So when it changes, it reevaluates anything that's dependent on that, and ultimately the file contents are reevaluated, and MGMT is pushing a new graph to the engine every second. Could be every second, it could be 10 times per second, it could be once every hour. This is kind of the equivalent of a whole puppet run every second. If you think about it, you know, run puppet takes a while to run, this is happening every second. Um, and one of the inputs is actually the microphone. So if you look, if I make noise, you can see my microphone on my laptop is actually taking that input stream of data, the noise, um, and using that to do something. In this case, totally contrived. But you could imagine building something based on load. So you can see the system load here is changing and so on. Does that make sense? It's kind of a silly example, but that's how it works. We'll kill that. Um, I don't need to show you this user ad demo. You add a user, same thing if it disappears. Um, I want to show you some more new stuff in MGMT. Maybe less exciting visually, but gives you the idea. So in Puppet, we've all had this issue where we wanted to create a file that was combined from a bunch of different files, right? Has everyone done this? There's different patterns. I wrote an implementation in this in Puppet, which I think is better, uh, called whole and frag. Um, the Puppet one is called, what's it called? Concat, thank you, yeah. Um, the con Concat one is really yucky. And so I realized this should just be part of the core file resource. I don't understand why it's not. So if you have a file, you can specify the state, so exists or whatever, but you can also specify content or uh, something like that. But in, instead of specifying content, you can actually just specify fragments as a native parameter in the file resource instead of content, and it will just glue together all those fragments. In this case, I have a directory and a file. Do you want to see that work? Yes, no? Yes. Yeah? Let's see. Hmm. So I'll just run, I think it is frag. So I'm going to run this code. Oops. Um, I need to use the uh, dev version so not get messed up. I run MGMT. And where is the file? So it's created the file, right? So just so you can see what's happening, I'm just going to run this watch on the whole file. Um, and as I said, I composed this file of this frags directory. And um, if we go in that directory, I'll just go down here. Um, frags, oops. So I've defined, I'll just remove all these for a sec. I've defined um, these three files explicitly. So if you look at the code, Sorry about all the terminal changing. If you look at all the code, I defined the directory, I've explicitly created three files, and this bonus file, and then here at the bottom is the fragment. So, um, excuse me, oops, there we go, Vim issues. So um, these three files are explicitly defined, and if you remove one, you can see it comes right back, right? So same, I've shown this demo before, but remove f2 and cat f2, MDMT is always guaranteeing the state, so it's super, super fast, always there. But the other thing you can do is you can echo, hey, config management tab into F4, and you can see that other file instantly takes that in as a fragment. You see that? So, hey, are you awake? No. Yes? No. Um, is that cool? Um, so imagine someone just dropping stuff in and it automatically building the new thing right away. Um, and obviously, um, if you were to do something like, hey, are you awake to F2, how come it didn't work? How come? Right, because I explicitly told F2 that it should have certain contents, okay? So a little basic thing, but that little bit of polish I think is, is an extra little bit of magic. Uh, do you want to see more demos, or have you had enough? More? That was very un unexciting. Would you like to see some more demos, or should I go? Yes? Yes. All right, cool. Um, so reversible resources. This is a new feature that exists uh, in MGMT. Uh, this is a very important feature. So we know about item potence, right? You apply the same thing, and you get to the same sp spot. We also know about convergence. So if you have uh, specified the 
required um, end state and you move from state whatever to your end state, your resource will be converged. Yes? So there's a third property which is called uh, reversibility. And that is if you can move from whatever state to that desired state, in theory, for most resources, if not all resources, there should be a reverse operation that takes you back to the state you're at. And if you can define that, then you can be reversible. And in fact, we have implemented this um, not for all resources yet, but um, for at least um, starting off. And the engine takes care of all this magic. And so this is the kind of puppet problem. So you create this file, temp hello, and then you take away that puppet code and you run puppet again. What happens? The file's still there, right? So if there was a way for when the code disappeared for it to undo some operation, that could be really useful. Now we could do it for files, and I'm going to show you that demo, but imagine if this was a virtual machine. So just by scheduling the code, by putting the code there, you now define some state. And by taking it away, that stops it. Okay? Now I want to make this demo a little bit more interesting. So I'm going to show you, um, show you some code. Um, what's this code? Reverse. So I want to show you this in real time. So here's the code down here that I'm, I'm going to run. It's creating this file. And I just specify meta reverse equals true. So this means the engine will do all the magic stuff. You don't have to know how this works. And instead of actually deleting the code and pushing a new version of the code, I want to just show you this live. So I have this mod variable, which is just a Boolean, which does the same thing. And this is basically looking at the date time. And every four seconds, this value is going to switch from true to false, true to false. That makes sense? It's kind of looking at like if the time is even or odd, but mod four. So that you just wait four seconds, and then this becomes true and then false. So that means that it's equivalent to this code existing and then disappearing. OK? Yeah? Yes? Everyone in the back, can you hear me? All right. I know it's the end of the day. I'm trying my best. So let's run this. Reverse one. OK, so we run this over here. This we don't need. MGMT. Um, don't need the daytime file. So, if we just cat this file, you can see the file's there. Four seconds go by, and it comes back. So it's there. Four seconds later, it disappears. And that's the engine. It's running in real time, and it's saying, create this file, and then take away the code. Oh, goodness, what should I do when I take away that code? I should remove the file. Isn't that cool? You can clap if you like. <laughs> All right. Okay. But that's, that's the easy stuff. Let's make it a little bit harder. I'm going to show you verse 3. Um, we can do cooler things. So same thing, the alternator. But in this case, look at how we're defining the file. Um, we're, not, we're not defining. This, this line doesn't, isn't here, OK? We're just specifying the file mode. Nothing else. Not the state and reverse. So um, just do that. So there's a file here. It has contents hello. That just happens to exist on the system. And now when we run this, um, let's just do an ls-l. And look at the file mode. Oh, it's switching. <laughs> because what's happening is we've set the file mode to 700 or whatever it is. And then when we remove that code, it's undoing whatever operation it was. So in that case, it's reverting the mode to whatever it was before MGMT ran. Does that make sense? So again, this specific property, why you would want to do this for mode specifically, may or may not be useful, but I'm always giving abstract examples, which are kind of shitty. But I'm going to show a real life example later. Is that cool? Quick question. Quick? Yeah. Um, what happens if you stop uh, MGMT? Is yeah. it, does it know that state? Right, so the question is, um, if you stop MGMT, does it know its state? So the, the cool thing, it's, I know what you're saying, is it dangerous, would it be like stuck in a confused state? And the reason why it's actually fine is because it will be, in this case, in one of two binary states. It will be either one in the running state, um, where it has changed the file, and before it changes the file, the way this actually works is it's secretly backing up any relevant information that it's going to need to restore. Right? So that's how it does that. So if it's in the running state, then a secret state file exists just with that information. Alternatively, if it's not in the running state, then it has previously restored it, so it doesn't need that state file. So assuming there are no bugs, which of course they're not in code that I write, then it should be fine. 
Yeah, good question though. Yeah, um, and uh, yeah, the more interesting question is where does it store the state file when you have a cluster of these things? And you have to be an MGMT. MGMT sponsors get information on all the internals and the cool hacker stuff and the design things that I think about all day. So if you sponsor MGMT, you get to know all the inside information. And it's super cool what we do with the state files. It's not annoying like Terraform. No offense. <laughs> it's not, it's, I mean, it's not meant as a disk. It's just, it's a different kind of state file. It's still called a state file, though. Uh, does that make sense? Um, just for fun, if you, for example, I don't know, if you had, if you had, if you had just modded it to something different, it would restore whatever it originally was. So, um, reversible resources. Um, I'll show you really quickly, if you look at the readme, oh goodness, there's a, an example in the readme where we have basically a scheduler function, and it runs on each machine, and ultimately it returns a list of host names that were part of the scheduling group. And then ultimately down here you say, is my particular host name in this set of scheduled, oops, scheduled host names. And over here, I just put a print example. But you can imagine here, you put something like, uh, you know, Docker, container, uh, container, whatever, um, and meta reverse true. And when this gets scheduled, it will start the running container. And when it's unscheduled, because it's this reactive language, it will take away the container. Um, and so what have we done in like 10 lines of code? We've built Kubernetes, right? If you think about it, like it's so crazy that people have over-engineered this complex architecture, and maybe you want Kubernetes like this, or maybe you want it a little bit different, so let's make a thousand YAML parameters to tune all those little things. No, just take this and copy it into a class and ship that. And if you want something slightly different, no problem edit that code, make a different class. Um, and if you don't like Docker because it's not cool anymore, no problem. End spawn. Mm -hmm. Done, right? So that's how, that's how infrastructure should be built. And again, the end user doesn't have to ever see this code. This could just be wrapped inside of a project that you put a fancy web UI on so you think you're getting value, and it takes in a, a text file to configure the names of the containers and nonsense like that. But this is how we should be building infrastructure. Make sense? Yeah. I'm just building a tool for you to build the infrastructure that you want. Was someone clapping or were they just excited? Okay, no, you don't have to clap, it wasn't like, anyways. So, um, do you want to see some more demos or should we stop? More? More, more. Do you want to hear more? More. All right, cool. Um, okay, so TFTP. So what is this about? So MGMT is novel in the resource model that every resource, file, package, service, EC2, virtual machine, container, they all have the standard check and apply state that Puppet and Ansible and every other tool in Terraform have. But they have that one extra property which is that event-based nature of the resource. And that's when we can tell if the resource state changed and revert it back. And fundamentally, the way that's implemented, there's a watch method in the resource API which can detect state changes. And it's basically what um, is called uh, main loop programming. So you have a function which the engine runs and it's running basically just a program. Um, most of the time the programs are very simple. For a file, it's just asking, I notify, hey, wake me up when something happens and spits out an event. But because we have this uh, main loop per resource, we can actually run useful code as well. And one of the things we can do, so we can actually run an entire server process to do something unrelated to MGMT itself. And as a simple example, I've implemented a TFTP resource. TFTP is like a shitty like HTTP server. Um, it's used for like provisioning hardware and stuff like that. And so what I have is I have this TV, TFTP server resource, which is in Git master, and you give it a port to run on. In this case, I'm picking 1069, so I don't need boot. So all my demos, you'll see there's no root, right? Super safe, easy, unprivileged. And for the server itself, you want to actually have files that are available to clients talking to the server. So I have a TFTP file resource, um, which has some data. Um, and even you can have a root directory with a file here down at the bottom that shows you uh, there's a directory and you put files in there. So these are separate resources, which are effectively separate mini code bases. And somehow they have to link each other and work together. So how does this work? It seems a little like, I understand the one resource, you can have that one TFTP server resource with like a bunch of parameters, but this is much more logical and lets you split apart your code. So how do these all work together so that you have a, a sane TFTP server? 
Anyone know? If you were ever at my first year of MGMT talks, you might know the answer. Don't be shy. Okay, I'll show you a different example as a hint. So here is a graph of some files, a service, and a few packages. Um, anyone ever seen this graph before? Look familiar? Maybe. Um, so what happens if you run this code in, say, Puppet? Puppet will say, ooh, there's a package. I'm going to install it. And then it shuts down the package manager and says, ooh, another file, another package. I'm going to install it. And then it keeps doing this, right? So there's an overhead to start up the package manager, check the cache, and install the package. And this sucks because um, you have to wait a little bit longer. It's one of the reasons, one of the many reasons these tools are slow. And so MGMT does something cool. It has a feature called automatic grouping that can apply to any resource. And what it does is if you just produce this graph, because the end user code, the end user is not supposed to think about optimizations, but the program MGMT itself should. So what it'll do is it'll look at this graph and it'll automatically rearrange the graph into this particular form, which is a valid representation of that earlier graph, because it knows those three package resources have no dependencies between them, so it can group them all into one resource vertex and install them all in one shot together. Does that make sense? And so that's a really cool thing that we can use for all sorts of fun properties. And if we go backwards, oops, uh, to here, this is exactly what the TFTP resource does too. So it actually looks, you can, you can actually group uh, resources which are not of the same kind. So it actually will group the file resource and the server resource into the same uh, resource bubble and run the two together and it knows how to do that. Should we see a demo? Yes. No, okay, no one, anyone want to see a demo? Yes. <laughs> I'm sorry, this is annoying. <laughs> yes. So I'm gonna run this code. So I'm running the TFTP server on the left and I forget how to run the client. I have the client code here somewhere. Examples, TFTP, and so if I go go run, so this is just a simple uh, Golang TFTP client. I specify the port, and I think there's a file called file zero. So if I run this, just make it so you can see. Run this on the right, boom. You can see it connected, um, it got some file, and it showed us the contents. And you can see over here, the TFTP server resource spit out a log message to say, hey, someone's asking for stuff. Is that cool? And there's a few more files. Do like file two and so on. You get the idea. So that's, um, there's a few reasons I did this. One, because I have some stuff to deploy by TFTP, but anyone who's building and provisioning infrastructure, it's like crazy complicated to like set up a TV, TFTP server. It's annoying. You have to install that package. You have to install Zynet-D and the config file to set that up. And you've got to point to a directory of all the files. Right, for, for provisioning hardware and SIP phones and everything. This is all in memory, in MGMT, as part of the configuration process. This is how the future foreman or cobbler is going to be built. It's going to be built as a shim on top of MGMT that does all this stuff in process. Right? The, the, the file zero was never on disk. It's 100% in memory. Um, and other servers are going to get built Probably a simple DHCP server. I started looking at some of the code. Um, probably an HTTP server. You can go crazy, right? Um, yeah. Uh, do you want to see some more demos? Yeah. Okay. So I wanted to show a real life demo. So this is actually um, a SIP phone in Canada in some poor office where I run this asterisk server for somebody. Let's just log in. So if the internet doesn't work, you won't get this demo. I'm basically going to show the same thing I just did. There we go. It's these grand stream phones that are super crappy and super buggy. Um, so, oh, okay, oops. The internet died, that's why. Okay. So on this server, you can actually, oh, MGMT wasn't running. So MGMT is running on that server and port forwarding so that I can actually see the SIP phone web UI. And we can log in. Please don't steal my password with password. So the SIP phone works. The office person is very happy. It's noon, so let's hope she's at lunch. Um, factory reset. Shall we do it? Yes. Oh god, I hope there's no 911 emergency right now. Uh, you made me do it, I'm not responsible. So this is actually a phone that's rebooting in Canada. Um, and um, this takes a while, so I'm going to just let it sit while I show you more of my talk. But I'm not going to touch this terminal. We're going to go back 
these are just SSH errors because this guy is trying to connect. And there's no phone there. So that's not part of the demo. Um, but if we wait a little while, the phone will boot up and eventually you'll see here the TFTP logs of the phone uh, talking to MGMT, getting config that was templated with MGMT, and booting up and hopefully re-registering re with asterisk. Is that cool? So uh, that will sit there and we go back down here. Okay, let's do something a little bit more technical. So do we have four loops in the language? Marcel, you're missing all the fun stuff. Um, do we have um, four loops in our language? No. Why or why not? So we don't, and what's the reason why not? So it turns out for loops are super unsafe. Why? Because you can make off by one errors and so on. So typically in functional languages um, like ours, uh, you can't do that, but we do want to do iteration because iteration usually work. So um, there's different ways you can do iteration, uh, like map, reduce, filter, those things are coming and that sort of stuff. But I want to show you just some basic iteration. So I'll show you um, right here. So here's a simple example. So we have just a print resource. It's just a simple example that doesn't do much. So we have, let's, let's first count all the resources we have together. So here we have one at the top. And then over here we have this one, but the, the unique identifiers for the resources based on this names variable, right? And you can see how many are there? <laughs> loud, be loud. Two. two, there's two, right? So unique uh, names have to be a string, so you can have a string or a list of strings. So that means we have one resource plus how many? Plus two, which is three. And then we go down here, we have this one. We have how many more? Two more down there, so that's five. And then we have more names here, which is how many? Three more, so how many total is that? Okay, eight, so remember that. Now let's look at the edges, so the dependencies between the resources. Um, if we look at this one, there's no dependencies that, that we can see. We have this one, no dependencies. Over here, we have how many resources? Two. two. And we have, it depends on these other ones. Two. So that's two. So if there's two and they're both linked to two other, how many edges is that? Yeah, two times two is four. So that's simple multiplication. And then down here, we have an, uh, an edge that is all by itself. So it's this number to that number, which is how many? How many here? There's two here, and there's these ones, which is how many? Three. So two times three, plus the four we had, so that's how many? Basic math with James. No worries. So we had how many resources total? We had eight, and how many edges? Okay, so let's run that. Let's see if it works. So it's going to print out all the graph, but if you look, it'll actually even tell us the size of the graph, so eight vertices and 10 edges. So again, we don't have a direct looping construct, but indirectly you can do a lot of um, things that are equivalent uh, because of resource um, and edge multiplication and stuff like that. So that list can actually expand things out, which is similar to iteration. Does that make sense? And it's completely type safe. There's no nils, there's no undef. You can't crash this, basically. Sort of. It's complicated. Um, so that's the story. Part of my compiler is actually missing part of the implementation for functions and values. So map, filter, and reduce are not actually implemented fully yet um, because compilers are hard. So if you are good at going and want to help finish the compiler, please let me know. Um, here's another little show. I'll show you some, some of the function stuff. So again, less demo fun, but um, it's uh, this is a boring demo. So let's do that. Uh, sorry about this. So here we have um, a little function. This is a lambda. So the function is a value. And we take an x, and we do x plus x. So what should that do? Well, over here, if we have num equals 2, and this out value is running that add function with 2, 2 plus 2 is? Right, so we would expect that to happen. But if you were to instead pass it a string, and you do string hello plus string hello, what would you expect? Anyone? Should it do this? Should, so should this code work? Should it be a compile error? What do we want to have happen? Anyone? Don't be shy. There's no wrong answers. Just uh, bad code. Um, so yeah, so this will actually do, I'll just run this so you can see. 
Um, so if you run this, you can see, sure enough, 2 plus 2 is 4, and the hello plus hello is hello hello. So this kind of feels a bit like a dynamically typed language, right? Like kind of like Python where you can do these cool things. And that's a problem, because if we ever had a situation where we did an integer plus string, or like integer plus bool, what happens in Python? Come on, someone's done Python before. What happens if we do like integer plus bool in Python? Yeah, value error. It's going to like explode or not work. And so the whole point is this is bad because your program is running, you're building data centers, you're like running like a MRI machine or whatever, and then suddenly your things break. So that's bad. So it makes for unsafe programming. But at the same time, it's useful to have dynamic values. So in fact, what we do in MGMT is just before compile time, everything can be dynamic and you can have these polymorphic uh, functions that take different signatures. But during compile time, during our type unification, we actually ensure that there's only one solution that's possible. And if there's exactly one solution, then that's what we use and everything gets a concrete type. So this function up here, because the plus operator is polymorphic, allows you to do that. But at uh, compile time, you'll actually build one version that takes int int to int, and another version that takes, uh, sorry, it'll take one version that takes int uh, to int, and another version that takes string to string. And we'll build those two separate versions, so that way we always have a safe uh, language that's running. Does that make sense? Um, this is another reason why we can have printf. <coughs> Excuse me. Because printf itself has an infinite number of signatures that it can have. It typically has a signature, that's the types that it takes, which is string, and then any number of types of any different type, of which there's an infinite amount for all the arguments, and then returns a string. So any function in MGMT can take between one and an infinite number of different types, and at compile time, we have to search through and find one exact uh, version. Is that cool? So the idea is that you get the feel of a friendly functional language without all the, uh, the scary bits. Let's just check on our phone. So you can see here's our TFTP server. It, uh, this is all the crap that Grandstream phones like to download. And you can see that our phone is back online. Is that cool? Let's see. They're so slow, these phones. There we go. Let's see if the phone works. And it's registered again. Cool. So if anyone sees Walter, you can tell him that I'm using MGMT for something real. And I'm just going to shut this down. Uh, anyone want to make a phone call on my neighbor's, uh, my friend's uh, dime? So, um, walk off. So, uh, that was the function stuff. Uh, cool functions like variable capture inside the lambdas and other function works just fine. So you can play around with this and so on. Again, passing functions as values to other functions currently is not implemented. I doubt you'll use that, but it's something that we have to build. Um, you want to see a version of this with classes? Does anyone want to see this? Again, this is super boring. These are the boring demos, but this is the config management camp talk. So um, it's the technical talk for the technical people. So same sort of thing. You can have classes in MGMT, and they can be parameterized. So this is full class. Um, classes take uh, parameters and return a statement, so or any number of statements. So that's other resources, for example. So here's a foo, and this one is a bar, which returns some other resource. And you can see this foo one, you can have multiple times, and it will be allowed. This bar one uh, looks similar, but there's parameters. So this is kind of a question in Puppet. What happens if you do like package cow say ensure installed, and then package cow say ensure installed? Duplicate yeah, duplicate resource. The compiler doesn't allow this. And this is pissed me off since the very beginning because I might want to ensure in two different modules that Tauce is installed, right? It's like a fundamental part of any infrastructure and assuming that it can only be in one place is unfair. And this is one of the many things that got me to write MGMT. The truth is, the correct algorithm is, the output of all the resources that you want to run has to be compatible with each other. So if you have two identical resources and they don't conflict, for example, install package Kause the exact same way. There is zero reason why this shouldn't be allowed. Does that make sense? Does anyone disagree? 
Um, and so as a result, this is allowed. In fact, not only is that a log, when it's checking for duplicate resources, what it actually does is each resource has its own algorithm to decide if it's allowed to be compatible with another one. So if they're identical, it's just allowed. But if it's something, for example, package ensure latest and package ensure installed, those two should also be compatible because as long as the package is installed, uh, as long as the package is installed in latest, then it will be allowed. So that kind of thing is also allowed. If you do package ensure installed and package ensure uninstalled, this will obviously be a compiler error or a, a runtime error. So that's the kind of thing. Um, excuse me, a compiler error, not a runtime error. Um, and so as a result, if you do something like you include the same class twice, in this case, they're exactly the same, so that's completely allowed, and it won't be a compiler error. And in this case, if um, the parameters work out such that it makes the exact same resource, in this case it does, that's also allowed. Oops. And so, shall we run this really boring example? Boom. So it runs the thing. Again, not fun demos, but that's the story. Um, that's that. I'll show you one slightly more fun example. So MGMT is all about modeling real-time systems. And real-time systems change over time. So the idea that Terraform and Ansible and Puppet have is that your infrastructure is static at this point in time, at this specific desired state. And anyone who's a system in knows that's not true. And we work around that by saying, OK, crap, something has changed. I'm going to patch some code, push it to Git, push it to Terraform, Terraform plan. I look at what it does, and it makes the change, right? Who's done this? Everyone's done this. If you're not, you're shy. So um, MGMT is all about modeling that time. And hopefully things aren't always constantly changing, but they probably will to a certain degree. I would expect that in real life, um, your systems will probably be mostly uh, static. Some of them will probably have a bunch of changes at the start when you first deploy and then nothing ever again, or they might change a few times when there's really high load or really low load or some error scenario that MGMT fixes for you automatically. And maybe in a few situations, you might have some sort of cyclical workload. Uh, for example, on Fridays, you always shut down the like file server, makes people go home or something like that. So you can build these cyclical workloads. Um, and if you want to get really fancy, you can actually build state machines into MGMT. And this is an example of that. Uh, again, a bit of a contrived example, but um, just to show you the idea. So the code looks approximately like this. So if we're in the default state or state one, whatever that is, we're going to run a timer resource. Uh, this is just a shitty timer resource made with an exec, just so it's very obvious what it's doing. It's going to sleep for one second. And then it will wait and do this uh, second resource, which is a KV resource, which sets uh, some string value of two in a certain key space somewhere. And that key space is what's read when we read the state value. So if we're in state one, sleep for a second, then go to state two. If we're in state two, sleep for a second, go to state three. If we're in state three, go to state one. Does that make sense? And just to make this a little bit easier to see states. Um, this is the full code. We'll actually also just create a file with um, the state name in the file name. Okay? So let's just run this. States zero. So it's running on the left. It's my. Um, and you can see we can remove the hello file. Oops. And you can see state one. Two, three, one, two, three. Cool? Kind of boring, but this is the fun stuff. So this is all happening on a single machine. The example which I've not shown here is imagine you have this running on many machines and they each are not only following their own state machine, but pushing that state um, to etcd as this value is so everyone else can see it as well. So you could have like marching ants where you have um, a whole bunch of machines all moving to state one. Everyone's in state one. Okay, now we all go to state two. Everyone's in state two, and so on. And um, again, pretty bit of an abstract example, but instead you can think of um, something like uh, you want to shut down a certain number of machines in your cluster, upgrade them, and then only when they're back in production, you start them up and then do it on the next two. So how you can build these deploys and rollouts for example, so you have a whole bunch of machines, you pick randomly two, you shut them down. When they come back up, they move themselves to state number two. Okay, we check, we pick two other nodes in the default state, shut them down and so on. Um, and you can gradually move 
and do fancy migrations and live deploys and all sorts of cool stuff this way. Does that make sense? Hopefully as MGMT gets more mature, I'll actually build these bigger complex examples. Uh, hopefully someone pays me to build them, but um, that's the idea. So um, this is, there's a whole package import module system. I have basically eight minutes left, so I'm gonna just finish off a little early and ask for questions. Um, there's many different ways to run the language, fun stuff. Future work, so there's always stuff to do, it never ends. Um, there would always be great to have more functions in the standard library. We have quite a lot, so the, there's no facts in MGMT the way there are in Puppet. We have functions. And if you think about it, a fact, and all these things run locally on each machine, a fact is just a function with zero input arguments. And so we have many functions in MGMT, some that take no arguments as input and some that do. So it just makes them more powerful. And uh, so we can check if a machine is a Red Hat machine or a Debian machine and so on. We probably have some that we're missing, so there's a lot of new functions that we'd love to add. So these are pretty easy. There's a Golang API where you just write the code, wrap it in this small shim, and if you want to write more, that would be awesome. Uh, tomorrow at the hackathon, we'll show you how to do this and help you write one. New resources. If there's a resource that we can't, we don't have currently that you'd like to add, like some new cloud resource or some other resource that I haven't thought about, there's an API to implement. You can write a new resource if you know Golang in, in a few hours or maybe a day if it's a really big one. Uh, new features. Uh, these are some things that are sort of longer term. Um, so like automatic secrets. So I don't really think that you need Vault in a proper greenfield infrastructure. And how we do secrets and the magic behind that is uh, kind of cool and magic. But uh, for now, I'm not telling you about that. Paying, paying supporters get to hear these cool designs and see how you can remove secret storage from your infrastructure and build things safely. There are still some bugs. I have a race in the engine I have to kill. And finishing the compiler uh, for the functions as values is not 100% done, but hopefully soon. So I'm pretty optimistic. And even in the meantime, you can use MGMT today uh, to build all sorts of crazy stuff. These are sort of more uh, extra things that need doing. Um, how can you help? Uh, what can you do? You can use this, test it, patch it, share it, document it, star it, blog it, tweet it if you have Twitter. Uh, discuss it, hack on this stuff. Just hack on this stuff. Like this is an open source project, and if you don't get involved. Ultimately, it just makes no point, and I'll just make it proprietary, and you'll have to pay me if you want to use MGMT, and that would suck, right? Right? So, um, no, it's not over yet, so, so MGMT needs funding. So I used to work at Red Hat, and they were funding me for a while until they bought Ansible, and I wasn't as mature as Ansible. So here I am. Um, I decided to leave and work on MGMT for a while, but it super sucks because food is expensive. Um, so if you want to donate on Patreon, I have that. I think I'm actually getting much less money now. I think that was the max. Um, and of course, funding a hacker is very sexy. So please get involved um, if you want. And as a, as a last ditch attempt to sort of keep this open source and keep this a community project and not run by some evil company publishing proprietary crap, um, it's my last attempt that I can think of. I'm gonna try and launch a MGMT corporate sponsorship program. So we have a website coming for MGMT, and the idea is you pay us a small amount of money and we put your company's logo and link on our homepage in big. So if you can talk to your companies and bosses and say, hey, we want to support this because in a year this is going to be the coolest shit in the world, and if you don't support it now, it's going to be proprietary and then like hella expensive. So help me now and we won't have to do that route. Is that a fair deal? So please email your bosses like a few thousand per year or something you get a logo, maybe cheaper, and there's some other cool benefits, interesting things that I'll share and so on. So I'll be publishing information about this soon, but this is just a little breather. So send me an email. Um, let's just recap. Yes. Now let me recap. It's a bad joke. Thank you. Um, he's putting the cap back on his pen. I use the same jokes on all my slides. Like I'm writing code. I can't afford to make new slides and new jokes each time. We have an IRC channel. We're like 60 some odd people in there, so come hang out with that. Um, come hang out with us. Um, there's a Twitter account. Um, there's a mailing list too. Um, you can check out the technical blog of James. I haven't been blogging as much as I used to be because I've been busy writing code. I just want to finish this more. Um, there's obviously the GitHub project itself. You can go star that, and you can find Purple Idea on IRC and Twitter and all of these cool things. So you can ping me and say, hey, Purple Idea is really cool. Tell everyone about our stuff. Crappy marketing. Uh, tomorrow, uh, from 10 a.m., I'm going to be in one of the rooms 
doing kind of like a workshop slash hackathon. So come on by, bring your laptop, um, get hands-on use for this. It's free, um, but you should sign up so we know how many people to expect. Because if we're too many people, we'll get a bigger room. Um, and this was maybe what I was going to cover, roughly, but we'll sort of play it by ear based on who's there. So you can, if you've never used MGMT and you just want to play with it, we'll do that. If everyone's pro, we'll do something different. This is a joke a slide. Um, free stickers. The last thing, if I have, if you want a sticker and you don't have one and you will put it on your laptop, uh, come get one because they're super expensive. So uh, you can take a photo and tweet it at me on your laptop and that'll be cool. So you can have a cool laptop like mine. Um, and lastly, if you really like this talk, let's do a distributed denial of service. Let's go bug Chris, go bug Toshan, just go up to them for two seconds and be like, hey Chris, James's talk was so dope. And like, bug them to fund my project or something. Just be annoying in general and they'll think it's funny. Uh, thank you very much. So, oh, um, I know it's the end of the day and you all want to go home and sleep because I'm exhausted, but I will take some questions and when you're bored you can leave and if you want a sticker, in like five minutes when we're done questions, you can come up and grab a sticker. And remember, go talk to your companies and get them to sponsor my stuff. Uh, questions, anyone? Uh, yeah, gentleman in green. Um, <coughs> you're talking the entire attraction of how functional languages basically not making any mistakes. So can you uh, predefine your function signature? As in, if you're at x, can you well, require it to be a number? Oh, that's a good question. Yeah. So the, the person was asking if you can force a type and yeah, the answer is yes. So um, what was it? Polymorphic. So for example, if I said x and it must be an int and then we run this, oops, polymorphic. So in this case, it, it will not compile because it has that second example with a string. But if we go here and we just delete the string example, uh, oops. Delete the string example. Now you can see it runs just with the int. So yeah, good question. Yeah, you can you can always specify specific types, and our type system is is simple, but also I think I think it's just simple, but it has all the types you expect. So bool, int, string, float, uh, list of any of those types, map of any of those types to any of those types, and struct of any number of fields to having one of each of those types. Um, and function, sorry, yeah, which is the last one. So good question, yeah, thanks. Um, yeah, and just a fun little thing. So I, actually I didn't show this, but I'll show you just really quickly on that notion of types. So the way we have, we don't have a null value, we don't have undefined, because why don't we want a null or an undefined in the language? Why is that a bad thing? Like Puppet, you have undef, right? Why is this bad? Come on, someone's done Puppet. And I'm not trying to brag on Puppet, rag on Puppet. I've just done a lot of puppets, so I'm angry about it. <laughs> not really angry. Undef and nils are bad because you can have nil pointer exceptions where you do undef plus bool, and then you have like whoops, where you try to dereference a nil. So we don't have these, which makes languages much safer, like Haskell. There's no such thing, um, for example. So the way it works is if you want to have an undef, for example, we have this Elvis operator which basically says, if this is true, we use this value, otherwise we use nothing. So there's things like this. This is how we get around nils and stuff in the language. Um, more from the top. Any other questions? That was an enthusiastic hand raise. It's like, okay, I'll ask a question, but don't, <laughs> don't heckle me. Yeah, go ahead. Um, well, I'm not sure I understood how the reverse exactly worked. Right. And so, um, you said in an example, um, if I start a virtual machine, uh, the revert would be stopping it. Mm -hmm. uh, for me, storing the state of the virtual machine is not only about uh, being uh, running or, or not, because you could change uh, mm -hmm. in your configuration, what the definition of the machine is, like yep. different mix or something. Yep. something. So how does that technically work? Yeah. So broadly the question is, if you have a more complex resource that has many different parameters, how do you describe specifically what the reverse is? And maybe, maybe, for some obscure resource, you might have two possible different reverses that you might prefer to have one or the other. And the answer is it's actually very simple. I know this is going to be disappointing, but um, 
By default, we have a meta parameter which is built into the engine and built into every resource automatically. So do you want to reverse, yes or no? However, to describe um, what that reverse operation should be is a property of the specific resource. So basically, um, we use the MGMT engine to basically build a resource which is uh, what we consider the reverse. And that can be dependent on any of the properties of the resource itself. And if you want, because you have some weird special resource, you can have an additional parameter that helps give a hint to how you want to reverse it. So for example, if we were doing something, let's say for some reason you wanted to reverse slightly different. So we have, for the file resource, we have content, state, and so on. But in the building of that resource, you could have like a my reverse equals whatever. And this parameter itself could influence how you build the reverse resource. Like for example, let's say uh, you wanted to destroy, like shut down nicely to shut off a VM versus unplug it. So you could say like reverse, uh, reverse off is shut down. Oops, sorry, That's, that was not on purpose. Reverse shut down or you could have, oops, I can't type, power off. So you could have one of those two modifiers. And all those modifiers and what those look like, that's specific to the resource definition itself. Does that make sense? So um, does that answer your question? Yeah. Good question. Um, so I've implemented reverse for, I think, only two or so resources. Um, but it's very easy to do. And the reason I haven't implemented for the others is because I'm leaving those easier problems for mentees and people that I am teaching Golang to. So if you want to be one of those people, ping me. It's an easy going first. You need to do the easy tasks because I can do them just as easy as someone else. And the harder tasks, it's harder to find people to do. So I'm working on those. Any more questions? You gotta make this camera guy work by walking back and forth. <laughs> Any, anybody else have any more questions over here? Anyone? <laughs> He's following me, guys. He's following me. Hi. <laughs>